always start with something a little fun. Jeannie mentioned this to me, and, and, I, and sometimes, you know, what happens is that you get so familiar with something, you assume everybody else is following it, and they're all over it, and, <coughs> and they're not. But uh, this, is a, this is one where um, <coughs> we talked about it two weeks ago, but it's, it's such a critical, a critical thing. Uh, before I go there, I made a mistake in my math last week. I found out that the number of people on the earth today, if it happened today, are 7.53 billion people. And if you lost 33% of them, like the verse we were in, 2.51 billion people would die. Okay? okay so uh, that's the math. Wow. That's quite a bit of people. Uh, the other part is if you looked at it and there were 10% believers on the, on the earth, let's say even more than that, if you took those number of people... Um, who would not eat, it would be 0.15 times that. And so it adds another, I don't know, 300 million people, something like that, a lot of people anyway, to this number who are going to die because of the starvation. These would be the ones who don't accept the, the um, mark of the beast. Okay? So you're going to see this is, this is going to be a period of serious devastation, serious death. Um, you know, there's also a really interesting piece here. <clears throat> if you're familiar with, with Matthew chapter 25, when the Lord is talking, it says, it's called when the king returns. And he's talking about, um, you know, you, you, um, when, when, when my brothers were in prison, you visited them. When my brothers needed food, you fed them. Okay? That's these people here. That's these people right here. These are the believers who are going to refuse the mark of the beast, and they're going to have no food. Okay? And what happens is that some of these people are going to feed them. They're going to find ways to give them their food. They're going to share. They're going to allow it so some of these people will live because they will have no access to buying food because of the mark of the beast. But they will survive. And you see the Lord himself thank those people in the sheep and the, uh, the, sheep and the goats. If you remember that part in Matthew 25, where his sister says, and you and you and you and you you fed them and you gave them water and you visited them in prison. That's these people. Okay? That's them. That's who he's talking about. Just to let you know. So the people who are in this story here are the same people who are in the Matthew 25. Are you familiar with the Matthew 25 one? Let me just read a piece to you. Okay, I hate to you know, you'll familiar, you'll be really familiar with it as soon as I say it. But a lot of people think it's a parable. It is not a parable. It's a real um, where am I at? My heaven's sakes. Huh? Maybe I should get out of Romans and that would help me. It's the, um, the 25, yeah. It's called the king, uh, the, the king Returns to the Earth. And um, it's 25, yeah, 25. Parable, 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 parable. Resurrection of the king. Oh yeah, here it is. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come and be blessed now, my father, and take your inheritance. This is that piece there. Um... And it goes down, it's like in verse 37, it says, and the, and the righteous will, be, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did, you, when did we feed you? Uh, or, or thirsty? <clears throat> and gave you something to, de something to drink? Uh, when did you see a stranger and invite him in? You see, what happens is the Lord's talking about it, this is what confuses them, the Lord's talking about it personally. This is, this is the resurrected Christ that's doing this, and he's talking about it personally. He's saying, you, you fed me, and you took care of me. He says, well, when did we see you? When did we do these things for you? And what he's, really, he's not talking about himself, but he's talking about himself in the sense of people who believe in him. Okay? It's the same thing that when, remember what, uh, on, the, on the road to Damascus, and he, he, he calls down to Paul, and he says, so why, have you why have you persecuted me? Well, he didn't persecute Jesus, right? He persecuted the church. So this is the part where he's saying, he says, you know, when, when during the tribulation, because this is after the tribulation, Matthew 25 happens after the tribulation, okay? And this is when the Lord comes down. He's reigning the earth. But most people don't know what the context is. And what he's doing is he's telling them that you did this for me. You, did, you took care of my children. You took care of my brother. And you took care of, because that's what they did. And they, and they, and they provided them water and they allowed them to survive. And for that, they are, they are getting rewarded for that. Does that make sense? So if you have a chance to look at it, not many people know that context, but the context comes across like it's a parable. It's not a parable, okay? It's, it's, the, it's the resurrected Christ becoming king during the millennium. Can you say Matthew again? Matthew 25, yeah. Matthew 25. 
Yeah, a lot of people are not familiar with that verse, but it takes place right here. This is the part where we're in the, we're in the story right now. This is where it actually uh, takes place. So anyway, <clears throat> let's move on to happy. Let's, let's move on to uh, uh, happy New Year. Um, and this is this is this is in this is in uh, where most people would have their New Year's resolution. So I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to explain this stuff so that you know what it is. When a person becomes saved, and we talked about it last week, um, Bible doctrine. BD is Bible doctrine. And this is where you have in your mind, in your soul, um, a doctrine of Christ. You know? The, one of those, the, the first one you get is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus died for me. He's my Savior. He's my God. Okay? That's the first one. So when you're, in reality, you see this thing right here looks really small, but in reality, it goes many, many times this direction and that direction. You can fill up this whole wall with everything that you believe. Okay? And what you would find is that many things you have Bible doctrine in, but other things you have the doctrine of demons. Okay? And usually these things, I put them in here, usually these things are, are things that you have grown up with, okay? Somebody has taught them to you, okay? Um, and you accept them. And so what happens is that when there's a, a question about something, um, I'll, give, I'll play with some of my favorite ones, um, work hard, okay? Uh, some people are hard workers and other people are lazy, and everything in between, right? And we have a million categories like this. You know, what kind of parent I am, what kind of husband I am, what kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, how hard I do certain things. Do, you know, do I, um, uh, do I control what I think? Do I show up to Bible study on time? Okay? That's, that's one of these things. Some people sit there and say, you know something? It's okay not to. Okay? And this doesn't just go for Bible, it goes for church too, you know. Um, there's, a million th there's a million categories. And what happens is you have beliefs about those categories. And some of those beliefs that you possess are, in reality, doctrine of demons. And doctrine of de demons can come across as being very neutral, okay. What happens is that <clears throat> there is, we've talked about before, there's, there's, there's Bible doctrine, and his doctrine of demons. Now, what happens is most people, what we talked about last time, people think this is evil. And it is evil, but not in the sense that you think about evil, normally speaking. Okay? Uh, most of us think of evil as... <coughs> um, let, me, let me take Jesus' example. Most of us think about evil as, you know, uh, having an affair. Okay? The Lord says very clearly that... What else is over here in that exact same category is looking at a woman to lust for her. Okay? So, uh, does that, and that's not, that's very, very different than looking at a woman and saying, that's a very attractive woman. Okay? Um, and, you, and, and that's just a recognition of, of, of a fact. Same thing's true with men, too. So, it's not, there's no difference. I'm just using this one because it comes up. <clears throat> but they're in the same category. Okay? Most people, most uh, unbelievers, and some believers have categories. Says, well, you know, as long as I don't cheat on my wife, I'm over here. I'm in the good guy list. And what the Lord says is, no, 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 no. If you lust for a woman, you're on this side. You're not on my side. Because this one requires purity. Okay? Uh, it's not sinless. It's recognizing what's true. Okay? Um, and the other part is that, that, do I have the ability to violate my own values? Yes, I do. I'm a human being. I can do that real easy. Just like that. Um, an example of that, well, one of my favorite examples is that I can know that my children do something wrong, but when they do something wrong, I can sit there and say it's no big thing. Okay? That's a violation of my own values. Okay? And I can actually look at something my son will do, and I'll say, one of my sons will do, and I'll say, well, you know, as things go, that's not horrible. I'm agreeing with the doctrine of demons by, by doing that. Okay? Um, what I would sit there and say is that you're wrong. What you did was wrong and stupid, okay? And this is why it's wrong, okay? So does that make sense? So what happens is these things float. We think these things float, but in reality they don't float, okay? They're absolutes. And what's absolute is this side, 
And what people don't understand is that this is this side is everything that's not on that side. That makes sense? So what, what most people sit down and say, well, this is 50-50, or maybe it's 30-70. In reality, this is 1%, and that's 99%. That makes sense? Okay. So it's, it, it's important to understand what we have. What's more important than that is to, like if somebody sits there and says, well, you know, I, I don't have to work hard. I just have to, you know, I have to show my boss that I care, and I have to show up on time, and, you know, you have all these things that you're going through. But reality is that the Lord says very specifically, whatever you do, you do for? Unto the Lord. Unto the Lord. That means that you don't work for your boss. You work for Jesus Christ. And if you don't work hard, in reality, your doctrine's over here. It's not over here. Okay? Um... <clears throat> If you pick friends who are, um, who are not, and this doesn't mean that, this, I'm not trying to say that, that if your friends sin, you don't hang out with them. Otherwise, you'd be by yourself forever, right? Even in this church, you would be. <laughs> okay? um, but what you do is that you, one of the smartest decisions I ever made as a Christian is um, the word's culling. It means to kill, <laughs> kill something off. It, it also means to separate. <clears throat> it, it is to Call your list of friends. You know, people who are not, who will not tell you the truth. People who do not walk in the way, who do not want the things that you want them. You need to cut them loose. Does that make sense? You need to remove them from your life because they will pull you over this side. Most people think that the evangelist, the evangelism only happens on this side. But there's also an evangelism on this side. A-N-G-E-L-I-S-M. There's an evangelism on this side. This one here is an evangelist for the cosmic system. Okay? And when you have people in your life who sit there and say, you know, you shouldn't work so hard. You, know, you shouldn't do your best. They're over here. That makes sense? They are. Okay? Because we're not talking about, we're not talking a, uh, a comparative here. We're talking about either you're here or you're here. Now, this is going to sound funny, and I don't mean for it to sound this way. It's okay if you're over here, but you know you're over here. It's wrong when you think you're over here, and you're, over he and you're really over here. Because if you think you're over here, and you're not, you're over here. You'll never call yourself on it. Ever. The great majority of Christianity, of Christians, do not call themselves on this. They don't call themselves on it. They don't sit there and say, you know something? That's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. See, if I, if I know I'm wrong, I'm convicted by it, that's better than getting to the point where I'm blind and I don't see. Because then at least I know I should confess it. Why is confession important? Because I cannot walk with the Holy Spirit unless I deal with that stuff. Does that make sense? So all your values, you want to be on this side. Okay? So in reality, you want to know what these things are. Um... What's important about this, and this is how it happens. I'll just tell you how it happens, and we'll come back and tell you why this is important. Um, in reality, you have a pastor teacher. They can be the same thing. Uh, um, and we know that because in, in Acts, we have a requirement for deacons to be able to uh, pick ones who can teach. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get in front of people, but it means that they teach in some manner. Okay, they teach on this side of the ledger. So it can be either one. And there's two categories. They either preach the doctrine of demons here, or the Bible doctrine. And what the doctrine of demons means is that they can tell you something that is not biblically true. A pastor and a teacher can tell you something that's not biblically true. Okay? And they, it's taught to you. One of them has the Holy Spirit, facilitates that. Okay? You have a gift given by the Holy Spirit, pastor teacher does, and he uses that gift. The, ha the Holy Spirit acts on two things. He, he converts what is said to Bible doctrine via the Holy Spirit. We know this from Jesus in John chapter 8 where his sister says, and he will teach you things that I don't have time to teach you yet. He, the true teacher of the Word of God is always the Holy Spirit. Always. It's never the person. Okay. Um, this is why we get away with uh, gospel. In the gospel, many times people murder the gospel. 
Okay, they murder it. Okay, they sit there and say, you know, if you just come up here and pray with us, you'll be saved. Say, no, no, no. The reality is that if you got that back in your chair and you understood it and you accepted Christ back there, you're saved whether you raise your hand, come up and tell anybody ever. You're saved as a result of faith. Faith in Christ alone. Okay? But what happens is you, you, you add something to it that's not true, yet the person comes down, you pray with them, and they're saved. The reality is they were saved over there. <laughs> and what you really did is that you facilitated. And when you're talking to them, saying all the goofy things that you can say. I'm not saying that you guys wouldn't do that, of course. But when you say, in reality, the Holy Spirit is the one who's telling them that truth. Why? Because they have no human spirit. They don't have the ability to understand spiritual stuff. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, at the end. The natural man cannot understand the Word of God. Everything is foolishness to him. Okay? So reality, that's true even with us, is that when we teach this gift, is energized by the Holy Spirit. That's why if you're not in fellowship, you don't understand. Does that make sense? You are not operational in a spiritual sense. So when you come in here and we have the 30 seconds, you confess anything, you make sure your slate is clean. The Holy Spirit's in you, the Holy Spirit's in me, the Bible doctrine is there, and, and He transfers that to you. And now it sits on a stage. Okay? That stage is right here. Okay? And right now, that stage to you is what's called Gnosis Doctrine. Okay, that's the word we talk about in the scriptures. It just, Gnosis means to know. But whenever you see it in the Bible, it's always written down knowledge. That's all it says is knowledge. There's another word for it, epinosis. Epi, you know, epi means up, upon. Okay, this right here is also, tran is also um, translated knowledge. Once in a while you'll see somebody write it and they'll call it the knowledge of God. Okay, but this is, this is true Bible doctrine one that is resident in your soul. That makes sense? It's true. It means it actually has power to it. This knowledge here is like this. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Yep, sure is true. 2 plus 2 is 4. That's a true statement. But does it have any power? Does it mean anything? No, it doesn't have anything to it. Okay. So when you hear it, this is why it was so important the other day, is that when you object to somebody saying something, that you don't believe. Sit and say, well, you know, I, I heard what you say, but I don't, I don't know if I buy it. You're right there. It's on, it's, on, it's on a little pad sitting right before you. Okay? And if it's the truth of Bible doctrine and the Holy Spirit has given to you, you are at a critical stage of whether you accept it or you reject it. If you accept it, it becomes operational in your soul permanently and is epinosis and you, you can utilize it. You now know the truth of God. If you reject it, the negative, okay, it now stays where it was. It doesn't move at all. It stays gnosis. It has no power whatsoever. And this little block in here, where that particular concept is at, still stays doctrine of demon. Right where it was when you left it. Okay? This is what happens. Now, ignore all the Bible doctrine ones. This is what happens when you give somebody the gospel. Okay. Now, for them, an unbeliever, these are all. This is all doctrine of demons in reality. Okay. It means it's non-operational epinosis. They can have morality in here, which is good, divine establishment, but it's not epinosis. It's not the power of God. Okay. In utilizing that sense. But what happens is when you tell somebody the gospel and they go, "I don't think so. That doesn't make any sense. Blood, cross, God. No, I don't. I don't that not make any sense to me." What happens is they heard what you said. Okay? The Holy Spirit was there for them, helping them to grasp it. Okay? And what happened as a result of that, this is Phantom Moore. I went, I'm freaking out. <laughs> like, I'm going to get in trouble. So, what happens at that moment is that you hear that, okay, and they reject it. So, what happens is that you have the little block in here. Okay, and I'm just taking one of these blocks out of here. And right now it has doctrine of demons in it. Is that Jesus, okay, is a nice guy. That's what that doctrine has in it. Okay? Jesus is a nice guy. You tell them, you tell them the, the gospel. The Holy Spirit speaks that. So they understand it perfectly clearly. This is Fenimore. <laughs> 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 
I can't help but I love her. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you hear it. Okay. They hear it. They understand it. Why do they understand it? Not because you said it right. Hopefully you did. Hopefully you assisted the Holy Spirit with true doctrine of, of, the, of the gospel. But when you said it, the Holy Spirit made sure that their soul understood what you said because they don't have a human spirit like we do. They don't have the ability to understand spiritual truth. But for the time being, whenever you do that, this is why is that when a person rejects the gospel, it's not on you, it's on them. Okay? Because you may have messed it up, okay? But the Holy Spirit did not. He hit it right on target. They understood it crystal clear. What they did is that they sat there and said, I don't think so, Bosco. Not interested. Thank you. So the doctrine of demon that Jesus is a nice guy did not get converted to Bible doctrine which says Jesus Christ is Savior. Died for my sins. Okay? That didn't happen. So they remain with the doctrine of demon. Okay? And they're unsaved because of that. It was something they heard, something they understood, something they chose. Okay? This all happens at God's level. Okay? This exact sign dynamics happens with believers. Once you become saved, you have this, okay? So, where you, I don't, I don't know, it's not right to do this because I already have some Bible doctrine here. But what you would have done is that he would have had this one and it would have gone, ah, Jesus is the Christ. He's now saved, okay? Baptized by the Holy Spirit, identification with Christ, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, eternal life, all the 36 things that we've talked about in the past. You probably don't remember them, but they're in your notes. <laughs> so what happens, that part changes. <clears throat> well, what's supposed to happen after that, in reality, this, this helps us understand. So when a person becomes saved <clears throat> for the first time, they become, there's only one time, but when they become sa saved, they change one box. Everything else is stupid. Every other box they have is stupid, okay? And I mean that, that they don't have Bible doctrine there because it wasn't converted. So what happens as a believer is a believer walks with God as he shows up to Bible study, as he studies his Bible, <clears throat> as he goes to church, as he learns things, God will put things in front of him asking, so what do you think about what I said here? So what do you think about what I said here? What about here? And he's going to do that over and over and over again. Okay? And what happens is that person gets the same decision. He gets to change one of these boxes at a time. Okay? Now, a believer is only useful to God when they are, one, operational, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the truth of God is actually the active part of them. Why is that? Because when they are, when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, filled, not, not indwelt, okay, and they have Bible doctrine, and they have, what are they producing over here? Fruits of the Spirit. Okay. Which is equal to Jesus Christ. Not Jesus Christ in us. Okay? <clears throat> Jesus Christ in us is a non-feeling positional reality that we have the moment we're saved and it never goes away. Ever. Okay? <clears throat> this is operationally Christ in us actually being reflected in us. Remember the joke I tell you, you guys should run into 20 or 30 Jesuses every day? Okay, my joke is that. It's because when a, when, a, when a believer is walking in the Spirit and the truth of God and his volition is positive, meaning that, that he, he, it is his outlook and attitude towards Christ that he wants to be operational. He wants to be like Christ. Okay, it's there. <clears throat> This, this is a fruit of the Spirit, not their fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. This is where the love, all the stuff in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Yeah. This is where this is. In reality, <clears throat> the Christian life is not us, it's Christ in us. Okay? But not in the sense of positional, in the sense of operational. Okay? And this is why people... This is why people will notice that. People will notice that. So what God does for us is that he, he gives us the opportunity to change every single thing. So what happens is that when you run into something as a Christian, the next day you run into and you go, and you go to, uh, to work 
And somebody sits there and says, hey, you know something I was thinking about? You know, if we just cheated this thing just a little bit here, we could make more money. We can just tell him this. And he won't really know the difference, but we'll make 15% more. Uh-oh. That's right, that's right. Okay. And what normally happens is you fold, you go, okay. Because if you sit there and say, no, 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 that, that's cheating. So just, why did you mind cheating? <laughs> yeah, see? So you see what happens. Is it, you run to the bar and says, you mean I can't live with my girlfriend anymore? Who says that? God knows I love him. Who says that? When people say it on the other side, God knows it. You go, oh, yeah, I'm sure it's covered by God's grace. That's the doctrine of demons. It's not covered by God's grace. God's really specific about it. It's over here. Okay? So what, what happens here is that God starts giving these things. And what happens is that you, the goal that we talk about here, this is not supposed to take the whole class, by the way. <laughs> when you, when this goal of maturity that you're growing into here, okay, it's changing these boxes out. The million things that you have in your life that your viewpoint and that you act at. You know something? When I come to the light and I, and I come to it and some guy comes up and flips me off. What do I do? I flip him off. Do I yell? And you do something? And I go, oh, oh, that's right. I'm saved. Okay. What's Jesus do? What does he do? Okay. What do I do? What do I do? Yeah. yeah, yeah he, he was mean. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. And now we both know, and we all know that Christians still do this stuff. Okay. Because guess what? These aren't all BD yet, okay? <laughs> They're not, okay? And, and they probably won't be even at the moment you die, okay? But what God does do is he brings the big ones. He takes the big ones down each at a time because they're so huge that they have to be looked at. They have to be reviewed because they're very obvious that to us as we become more knowledgeable of what God requires of us that they do not meet his standard. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so... It's like I talk about, whenever you make this decision here, these have consequences to them. They have consequences in your life. Okay? <clears throat> these people who grow and mature up to this one, there's a name we learned in chapter, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. What were they called? They called the, 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 called the Nakao. That's right, the Nakao. They called it the winners. N-A-K-A-O. Nakao. And we'll see the Nakao. We'll actually see the Nakao, something like the Nakao, even in the angelology that we're going to run into in Revelation. We'll see it all over the place. So why maturity is so important is that you are not truly useful to God in, 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 um, uh, in moving his plan forward to the world unless you're mature. Okay? All treasures in eternity come from this maturity. Okay? All blessings in time come from this maternity. Okay? So this is how important it is. So <clears throat> my, my whole point was this, is that when you are given a doctrine, uh, and, and Joe does this all the time. He'll sit and say, do I have an amen? Okay, he, he's asking you to confirm that you understand, the, you understand the question. Okay? And he's saying, go positive. And you may go, eh, I don't think so. And you go negative. In reality, it is your right to choose good or bad. Always. Every moment. Okay? The good thing about God, and I was telling my son this, I said, the good thing about God is that no matter how stupid you are, you don't have to stay stupid. Okay? You can change your moment. You can change your decision at any time. Okay? And what will happen is that when you change your mind to the positive, blessings will follow that. And then finally, God will be able to use you along your life at different things because he knows, like Job, that even under adversity, you will choose him. You will choose rightly. That makes sense? Then he can use you. You're going to be the guy who sits there and says, or gal, as the case may be, you sit there and says, you know something? I heard what you're saying. I really want to agree with it. But everything I know about God says it's wrong. That's the point where the hate happens. Okay? You're not very gracious. I thought Christians were gracious. Well, we are, except we cannot compromise these. Okay? These, the whole point, let me tell you something. The whole point is that, guess what? Bible doctrine is not my opinion. Okay? It's not my opinion. It's not, all I know is that this works 100% perfectly, and this works 100% wrong. That's what I know. That's what God has taught me over 
28 and a half years of being a believer is that every time I choose this one, things go well, and every time I choose this one, they go like crap. They go bad, okay? Um, not only do they go bad for me, but I lose a blessing. I lose an opportunity. They affect everybody around me. Okay? That's just true. It's a truism. So this is how it happens. And this happens every time you're in this class, every time we present a doctrine, every time you get a Bible study in, in church, every time you read your Bible, God presents you with His thinking. And He's asking you, do you understand what I just told you? How are you going to choose? And every time you change one of these boxes to this box, you are more like Him. You are more effective. You are more powerful. You are more impactful. Yes? So, choosing positive, does it mean, always mean that you agree? Because sometimes the person that's presenting the gospel is on the bottom line and it's not the truth. That's right. And so, how do you know if you're supposed to Say yes or no. Oh. <coughs> That's a setup question. I don't know. Just, uh, you compare with what? Bible doctrine. Bible doctrine. That's right. The problem is that many, many people, the great majority of Christians, do not know the Word of God. They can quote you a verse. They can quote you a piece of it. But in reality, is when you ask them a real live question, they go, "I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question." Uh, let me give you an example. One of the ones we talk about all the time is that Christians need to love. Okay? Jesus says they need to love. Everybody agrees with it. But where we get confused, is it personal love? Or impersonal. See, most people would sit there and say, well, can I get love? You know? Or God agape said, or phileo. Huh? Agape or phileo. Yeah, yes. well, uh, this is phileo here. Yes. Okay, and this is agape down here. This is the love of God. Right there. It's the impersonal one. It's the love that you, that you have. This is, how do you know that? For God so loved the world. Okay, what does God and the world have in common? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, is the world lovable? From God's point of view. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But yet God loves the world. He asks us to say, He doesn't do it with this. He does this with us. Why? Because we're His. In the conversation between Peter and Jesus, people get this messed up all the time, but if you look at the actual Greek words, the problem is that love is hid under uh, uh, phileo and, and agape. Okay? But he keeps saying, Peter's trying to get Jesus not to say agape, he's trying to get him to say phileo. He's trying to get them to say, do you love me as your family, as your brother? I know you love me, agape. You love the world, agape. Okay? He knows that. What he wants to know is, that, is it a personal love? Do you love me, Jesus? Am I yours? Okay? You have to read the answer to that, right? <laughs> so the whole point is that most people said to say, this is, and this is, this, what is this thing? This, the, the I and the you. Remember, personal love says, I love you. When it's personal, it's here to here. This is the object. It's so, OB, I'm sorry, I can spell. This is the object. This is, uh, I, I use my wife as an example, but I get in trouble every time I do this. Jeannie is so wonderful to me that I have to love her. I don't have a choice. Okay? <laughs> so even when she's a little brat, I still love her. I can't help myself. Okay? The object. This is personal. The object carries the value and it begs it from me. Okay? Except when she's really a brat. No, I'm just kidding. Can um, personal love be what a pastor has for Hopefully. He probably has a mixture of both. Okay? In reality, um, I'll, I'll switch it around so I don't get in trouble. When Jeannie loves me, she loves me personally and impersonally. Okay? Um, when, when I am doing all the good stuff and I'm really a good husband, and she's in a good mood, <laughs> I had to throw that in there just for fun. Okay, so what happens is that she looks at me and she goes, he is a wonderful husband. I love him. That's personal. Okay? 
But when Richard's not so wonderful, okay, which, which happens from time to time, apparently, uh, th this is no longer the deciding piece. This is the deciding piece. She says, I love you even though you're a brat. You're a butt right now, but I love you anyway because I have integrity. And that love from the integrity of God means that I love you and I hope God kicks your butt and you'll come back and figure it out. That's actually probably a real conversation in her head when it happens. <laughs> and that's how it should be. That's how it should be. In reality, reality, when somebody is doing something stupid, your prayer shouldn't be, oh Lord, have mercy on them. Your, Lord, your prayer should be, Lord, kick them to the curb. Just beat the crap out of them until they understand that this is the only way there is. That's it. That's really the prayer. So, so this, that should tell you is be careful about asking me to pray for you, right? <laughs> it's probably not going to be what you want. So this is the difference in these two. It's personal and impersonal. Okay? The, in, the, in, the, in the impersonal love, the integrity is held by the person, by the subject. This is called the subject, right? Subject, verb, object. Okay? The, the action flows this way. Okay, that's why we have that. So, okay, so in the impersonal love, the, ob the, the subject is the one who has the honor. This is, this is why you treat people with respect, even though many times they don't deserve it. Why do you do that? It's because the integrity of Christ is in me. Okay, why does God treat the world with love? Why does he love them? Because the integrity is in God. It's not in the world. World is never on the personal side. This is why when you tell people to love the brethren, you can, you, you, hopefully you're sitting there saying, you know, so I'm not telling you to love them personally. I'm telling you to love them with the love of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because guess what? They're butts. Most of them are not nice people. They have bad days. Christians can be real bozos. Okay? And reality is you have to love them with the love of Christ. You have to respect their right to choose, even though if it's wrong. Okay? You have to be, I call it diplomatic love. Diplomatic love is what you give people when you do not know them. It's just respectable behavior. I, I, um, and this, so this, this is how it plays out. So it makes sense. So that's what God's asking. So what happens is, is the part we were talking about before is that when somebody tells you to love the brethren or to love the world and to treat people with love, they're not talking about personal love. They're talking about impersonal love. They're talking about the love that comes out right here. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. You treat them with God's love through you. Not your personal stuff. This is what drives people nuts. Is that, you know something? Christians sometimes are not very lovable. Sometimes our kids aren't lovable. Our spouses aren't lovable. So what do you do? You switch from one to the other. You take one step back and say, you know something? I can still treat you decently even if you're a bozo. I pray for you. If I were you, I'd be careful about asking for prayers. You know, like I said, it may not be the prayer you're looking at. Um, so does that make sense? So what God wants you to do is that every one of these things you change. So you become operational like Christ is operational. This is why Jesus, when Jesus sat there and and if you remember, he was talking to Peter, and Peter sits there and says, I will never let them die for you. And he, says, and he tells him, he says, you do not have the things of God in mind. You have the things of men. What he was telling him is that your Bible doctrine is wrong. You're over here, bozo. You're supposed to be over here. Why do you want the cross? Why do you want me to die on the cross for you, Peter? It's so that you don't go to hell forever. That's God's point of view. Okay. Same thing, he says, you're not going to wash my feet. What's he calling? Get behind me, Satan. I said, that didn't sound very nice. It wasn't very loving, Jesus. <laughs> he was trying to pull him into the part that says, you got the wrong viewpoint, Peter. Peter's been with him for three and a half years. He wants to like, oh, I want to slap you so hard, but I can't because I'll write it in this Bible and I'll never know I slapped you. In reality, is that... God is always asking you, where are you going to perform from? What choices are you going to make? How are you going to operate? Okay? And like I said, it's better that you know, if you know the Word of God, you can compare what you do to the Word of God. You can compare what you think to the Word of God. And then at least you know you're wrong. Okay? You don't have, you don't have this feeling of, oh, I'm such a good Christian. God just loves me. I'm, just, 
Uh, he's so happy. He's so lucky to have me. And in reality, that's never true. <laughs> it is only by God's grace and grace alone that we are saved. But if I know it's wrong, I can deal with it. I can let it convict me. I can say, you know something, God? I have no power, but you have all power. And then I start with all true understanding starts with humility. You are not teachable if you are not humble. Okay? And this is true for anybody. Whenever I run into something that I hear, I take myself a step back and I, and I look at it and say, Lord, do I really understand this? Do I understand it? Why do I do that? It's because if I think I understand it, I will not listen. I'll condemn it. What I really want to do is I want to keep, I want to retain my knowledge of Bible doctrine, but I want to have an open mind so I understand what's being asked. Make sure there's not something that God wants to teach me. That makes sense? That's important, and it comes up in the book of Philemon. If you remember Paul and Philemon. Philemon, that's the whole book of Philemon about this, versus Paul. If you remember, the church meets in Philemon's house. Philemon's son is a pastor. Philemon is a mature believer, yet he has slaves, right? That's where Onesimus comes from, okay? It tells you something about slavery, but we're not going to go there. Um, but what happens is Paul... In the book of Philemon, he wants to teach Philemon something he doesn't know. Okay? He wants to teach him that a slave can be a brother. And so the question is, there's two responsibilities here. Is that Philemon, though he's a slave, has to act like a brother and the best slave he's ever had. That's a tough one. Okay? And on the other side, Philemon has to look at his slave and say, your position is actually much higher. So I have to treat you like my brother. I have to love you. As Christ loved the church. I have to do that. I have to give this to you because you are greater than a slave, which is the position you now hold. But in reality, from God's point of view and my point of view, you are my brother in Christ and I will be with you forever. And God loves you and I love you too. See? He had to teach him that because Philemon, even though he was mature, didn't know that. He did, he, Philemon didn't realize, you know how much, you know much pain Philemon's going to have to go into by forgiving his runaway slave who stole from him and treat him like a brother? It's not going to be pretty. <laughs> okay? So that's the part of this. Is sometimes if, if, if Philemon does not take the step back to listen to what Paul's saying, he won't get it. What Philemon can do is he can sit down and say, Paul, you don't understand. If I treat him well, I will get hard time from everybody who has slaves because now I haven't punished this slave. What prevents an uprising? Why isn't there justice here, Paul? See, he has all, the, all these great... But what, what Paul's trying to tell me says, you know, I need for you to go here. I need for you to take a step up. I need you to move past morality. I need you to move past law. Does that make sense? <sighs> you started this. So my whole purpose is that, this is what I want you to think about, is that when you hear a doctrine, do not dismiss it. Does that make sense? Don't dismiss it. Even if you don't think it's true, take a step back and go through your proofs, like I did. That, that, that. Is it true? Well, you know something, I heard what you said, but if I like this, that, I don't understand how it fits here. I don't know how, how, does it, how does it meet these criteria? How, how does it answer those? Okay? Because like I said before, the, the, the disservice you are doing is to yourself. Because when you leave these in the doctrine of demons because you rejected a Bible doctrine that was taught to you, it ends up being negative towards you. It ends up having an even bigger impact in your life because what God gave you to step up because he wanted you to do something better, you rejected. That make sense? You have to have a responsibility. Before you reject, it may be wrong. It may be this one. Okay? 
I want you guys to go out, go out tonight, and I want you to tell everybody how much you love them for Jesus. Okay? If you do that, don't mention my name, okay? Because <laughs> my whole purpose is that that is a doctrine of demons. You hear it in churches all the time. Why is it a doctrine of demons? Because the love you reach out to people is not personal love. It's the love of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus, your Lord. That's it. That makes sense? So they sound so perfectly side by side, but you have to discern which one's with. So if you go, I'm going to just go love and kiss it. Everybody in this church, I just love you, love you, love you. Not only are you an idiot, but in reality, you were fed a doctrine of demon, you said yes, and what happened is it went this way. It has no power in it. That makes sense? That's, that's the crux. Yes. Oh, Mrs. Fenimore was first. So, I have so, to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what happens if somebody hears a doctrine like, don't live with your girlfriend mm -hmm. or boyfriend, and they believe it, but they don't do it? Does oh. that turn to a... I mean, if they hear the doctrine that they can... But they just don't want to do it. And they don't want to do it, they actually get blessed from it. Because in reality, they wouldn't get blessed. The problem is that what happens is that when you get a doctrine of demons, okay, uh, and you, if you reject it, that is the proper thing to do with a doctrine of demons. Okay? The only way you can do that is by knowledge of Bible doctrine. The problem is that most people are not equipped. What they do do... Um, I was going to bring something up. Am I going to do it? No, I'm not going to do it. Okay, go ahead. Does that make sense? Well, In reality, you have to, if you don't have a basis for understanding it, you, you, if you reject it, there's, there's something here, you will actually be blessed because you rejected the doctrine of demons. Okay. No, but I'm saying that they... If you accept it, they accept it, but they it goes over to here. don't want to obey it. Because a lot of times it's hard for Christians. I mean, they'll, like... Your friend will tell you something that is wrong that you're doing, mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, I get it. I, I believe it because you showed me the verse, but I don't want to do it. In reality, does if, it if, actually change? Or no, it doesn't change. You, you have to, the doctrine, the do, Bible doctrine has to be a true doctrine that you accept. Okay? That you accept it. Because we hear, we it hear. Changes. You, you change it. You change it, yeah. Mind. You change it and you sit there and say, I heard what he said. I believe that to be true. It now becomes yours. It is now his epinosis doctrine. It is operational for the Holy Spirit to use. The Holy Spirit will not bring up gnosis doctrine. So even it will only bring, though it's right and they don't do it, yes. it doesn't. What they've done is they've actually taken a step back on, um, it, it depends. If they haven't changed it, if they haven't changed their belief about it, they're still retaining the doctrine of demons. Is that right? Mm -hmm. In reality, they are. Okay, they actually have to hear the truth and replace it to saying, yeah, that's mine. Mm -hmm. In reality, I mean, reality, in, in this class, you guys have heard hundreds, maybe thousands of doctrines since you've been here. And we teach them every week. That's what I'm saying is that this part is your responsibility. Before you reject it, in reality is that it, before you reject it, you have the responsibility to review the Word of God. Does that make sense? And the same thing's here. When you accept it as being true, what happens is you, you, when you hear it true, uh, hopefully what I... <coughs> Your Bible doctrine that you now possess usually gives you the ability to understand Bible doctrine that's given to you. That makes sense? When somebody tells me something, I use the Bible doctrine that I know to say, yes, that's true. I know these things. I know these things. They confirm what you're saying. Okay? An example was that I read a book one time, and I, uh, I've talked about it a couple times, and I read the book, and it was something I had never heard anybody say before, but when I read it, I knew it was true. As soon as I read it, I thought, this is true. It scares me to death because I've never heard. I've been a Christian for nine. I teach classes. I've been a Christian for nine years. I'm teaching classes to all these kids and things like that. And yet I've never heard anybody say with this power and this truth. Yet I look at it and I go, I know all these verses. It's true what he's saying. It scared me. Does that make sense? So reality it is Bible doctrine that you know that allows you to confirm many times doctrine of doctrine, Bible doctrine that you don't know yet. The Lord is presenting it to you. He's asking you a question. 
Okay, will you accept it? Same thing, same as the gospel. Very, very similar. Same dynamics. Except the difference is over here, you have your human spirit to discern. Okay, this is why it's what the scripture says, and the spirit speaks to your spirit. That's the combination. Yeah. Yes, um, this morning, you know, my son turned on, you know, Dr. Jeremiah. And the title of his... Can I make it really quick? Was, yes, uh, okay. very, very briefly. <laughs> the title was Fully Engaged, you said? Yeah, that's and, um, Was what? The title of his message was Fully Engaged uh -huh. in One's Relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And so, and you're speaking of love here, and he was speaking of love too. That if we love God, we will obey His commandments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, because that is the manifestation of, of a believer. In other words, and so when we are truly contrary to it, then that becomes a big question mark right there. Yeah, in reality, it, uh, your love actually goes the other direction. R love is actually based on knowledge. It's, yes. it's kind of the opposite. <clears throat> the more of this you have, the more you love God. In fact, I have a verse here, and I want to read it to you. you just, I just must have had you in mind today. Um, it's in Philippians 1... Nine, and listen to listen to how this verse sounds. It's one nine, ten, and eleven. But, he, but listen to the flow of it. Paul says to the Philippians, he says, "And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in yes. knowledge yes. and depth of insight." Okay. Yes. And verse ten is a as a, as a consequence of that, okay? So that you may be able to discern what is best, okay? And may be pure and blameless, and blameless. until the day yes. of Christ. That's well, this in a nutshell. That's this. That's what he's saying. Is that in reality, the more doctrine that you know, the more that you that you say yes to, the more that you. And I'm not saying that you have to discern what is what. You can't just accept every piece of stuff that is given by anybody who teaches, whether on television, no matter what their name is. I don't care who it is. This is the only truth. This is the active part. This is the part that says that your love may abound more and more is because you have Bible doctrine. Okay? It is because you know who God really is and you love His Word that you love Him. <coughs> Two whole minutes left. Well, we sure shot revolution, <laughs> revelation, didn't we? See, it is. So this is the New Year's gift. The reason I bring this up, and I think it's really important, is that you have to understand that every time God puts something in front of you, He's asking you a question. Will you follow me? Will you do it? And what he really has is that <clears throat> the bad news is, and this is a joke, bad news. The bad news is that somewhere up here, there's a lion's den that he wants you to go into. Okay? Or we can just go something with a Job experience. Okay? Or we can, can kind of go on. Uh, reality is that God's going to, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, then you have to choose to change these. All of them. Every single one of them. And the nice thing is, is if you're like me, you know how patient and gracious God is, okay? You know it is because you've been a Christian for many years, you've learned lots of Bible studies, and yet God is still changing you, right? Didn't you think He wanted to change those things in the beginning? <laughs> you know? Yeah, He did. I, but I see God changing things in me, bringing things up to me all the time, and I've been a believer for 20, 28 and a half years. I've taught Bible studies forever. I, I think I actually do know God's Word. But yet God sits there and says to me, you know, Rich, I know that you really like this particular thing, but I, we really need to change it. You know? He knew that 28 and a half years ago. He just had bigger things to do back then, apparently. <laughs> bigger things to change. So it tells you that our God is gracious. But what He really wants from us, what we really... There's two things. What he really wants is we have to mature enough to be able to accomplish these things for him in this plan. He can't use immature people. And the other part is that if you want a place in God's eternal kingdom, you're going to have to be qualified for that job. 
and you qualify, not there, but here. Guess what? Because there's no adversity there. There's no stress there. There's no refiner's fire there. Okay? That makes sense? This is it. Okay? And my, my prayer is, my prayer is this simple. Lord, help me to do whatever you ask me to. Bring me up to this thing right here. All I ask is that I, I, don't, I don't die before I have a chance to do the things that you have in mind for me that I don't know today. Okay? And when you run into these things, you'll have the same view as Job did. And luckily, maybe you'll have the one the lion's dead. Hopefully, the lions won't smell like Daniel said. But probably will. Yeah. Can I ask one quick question? Yep. So your Bible doctrine and the doctrine of demons, does that fit with that? Yeah. All of this is doctrine of demons. All of this is God's. Okay? Volitional responsibility. Arrogance. Remember we talk about humility. Everything that you... If you are not humble, you cannot be taught. I don't care who you are. Okay? You cannot be taught. It's just like Philemon. Just like Peter. Is that reality? Sometimes I think I can understand God's word very, very, very specifically and clearly and powerfully. And when somebody asks me a question that challenges that... I take a step back and say, okay, if I take it from the people, well, you're, you're an idiot. You don't know anything about God's word. Let me tell you what God has to say. Okay? When I do that, I am over here. <laughs> okay? If I don't recover over here, I have missed an opportunity that God has put before me. Does that make sense? Because many times, the lesson that God's trying to teach you is not one that is an elementary lesson. It's a PhD question. Okay? <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different question. Sometimes, <clears throat> and Jeannie and I have talked about it, I've told this before, but sometimes when God is working with on something with us, I look at Jeannie and I go, God's trying to teach her a lesson. You know, he's, he's just trying to, trying to show her something. Okay? And that, that, that's, that's, just, you know, that's just who he is. And Jeannie's probably looking the same way. I won't speak for her. But in reality is that if I do that, I know for a fact that Jeannie will get that lesson. Because her relationship with God is God's here and Jeannie's here, Jeannie Beanie, and she is faithful to this. And if she struggles with it, she comes back and prays and spends time in the Word of God and humbles herself. And God will teach her that lesson. Okay? If RB is over here, that's me, by the way, <laughs> and I'm thinking, God's really going to work on her, guess what I missed? God sits there and says, hey, Bozo, the lesson's for you. I'm just tagging her along for the heck of it, but the, really, you're the one who doesn't get it. I've missed this opportunity. Okay? I've missed it. And this happens so frequently with us is that we think it's a struggle going on this way. This is, this is what marriages look like. We're having a struggle this way. The struggle isn't that way. The struggle is this way. This struggle gets resolved when this struggle is right. Does that make sense? That's the key to it. The only struggle you ever have with that, if one of these people is negative towards Bible doctrine, you may be right with God, but this isn't going to be right. This is going to be painful. Yeah. So always marry somebody who loves God much more than they ever love you. And that will get resolved. You'll have a wonderful relationship. Let's pray. Now we've got nothing done from Revelation. <laughs> Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Hope that helped. It was... There's Grace. <laughs> yeah, let's get out the doom and gloom for a little bit, huh? <laughs> Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your great love for us, your patience, your grace. I thank you, Lord, that it's not about us, it's about you. I pray, Lord, that we will humble ourselves every time we hear doctrine and, and, and go to you with it, and go to your word with it, more importantly, not how we feel or what we think, but we have our allegiance to you and you alone, Lord. No matter who, no matter who else is involved, it's you and you alone. I ask this to be our way of looking at things as we move forward into this new year, a great chance to change things and to take as much of these doctrines that we hear and remove them and replace them with your truth so that we're more effective to you and to your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' holy name, who did that perfectly. Amen. Amen.